and we are live mm -hmm. i'm with mike wells master and engineer um you're 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 based in los angeles right mike yeah now? yeah i'm in la and you were in the bay area pre previously yeah i was in sf for uh until five years ago i just started year five here in los angeles before that san francisco yeah okay my, my first question is who has helped you who are you grateful for that has actually helped you develop develop yourself as a mastering engineer as a mastering engineer um yes, mastering. sure well without question the person who's helped me the most from a standpoint of um insight and amazing information has been doug sachs um you know i i had the amazing you know luck and grace to meet doug about three years ago i was the president of the la as chapter for a while and during the time on the chapter i was able to meet doug and work with him on some events that we did for the la chapter and hang out with him a bit and his team uh, Robert Hadley and his other folks and just you know I had already been in mastering for well over you know 13 14 years but just having the opportunity to sit with you know the master himself and talk about his career and how he viewed the craft I'd say that's it's probably the most profound experience I've ever had was getting to know Doug yeah all right everybody look up Doug Sachs um, okay so you know what? Let me give a few shout outs. Um, Gordon Gidluck, Tony Shepard, he just did the tech breakfast. Um, as a matter of fact, Mike, it'd be nice to see you at the next tech, tech I need breakfast. To make it, I just heard about those. I need to make it out to one of those. Yeah. yeah. It, it It's pretty interesting, bro, because um, on this one, after AES, uh, I, we went to one also after NAM. Mm -hmm. Manufacturers come in, they talk about their product. And let you know what's coming up and it it keeps being information that i don't get at say nam or aes and it, it's a breakfast where yeah. we're all just chilling talking to each other it's 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 kind of nice bro sounds and, like and, a lot of fun i'd like to go yeah yeah it, it you never know who's going to show up you know like you'll be sitting there and be like oh shit. uh let's see ricky cage or cage shanti samara Props on that, bruh. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, pe people, look that up. S-H-A-N-T-I-S-A-M-A-R-A. -A -A. The UN is backing him. He's a cons conservationist. We went to Irko's birthday party at AES. Ma Matthew Weiss has made it to LA. He is now down here. And you know we're always down with Pensado's place, Dave and Herb. They have the Gear Expo coming up in Nashville, something like the 21st. And produce like a pro, pro audio files. All you guys. So, um, I did a hangout with Simon Saywood. He makes um, Fairchild compressors. Have you had a chance to play with a Fairchild compressor yet? A real one? Yes. Yeah, I had a chance to play with one a couple times. Yeah. You, you've actually ran ran your um, used it for ma used one for mastering. I was at another it, another person had it, so I got to play with it. Yeah. Uh, I brought some material in and we were running it through it just to kind of have the experience, but uh, I've never had one in my own studio, no. I'm, a, I'm asking because Simon, uh, there was there's something in my memory about one being out on the East Coast that we might be able to get our hands on for a little while to play with. And, uh, you know, you're a master and engineer. I'm, I'm sitting there thinking it might be kind of cool to get it in there and, and see what you think about it see what bring you bring it over i mean the one i got to play with was a lot of fun <laughs> that's for sure it was a lot of fun it was uh, right. you think huh? you pour signal into it and it was like you know is that all you got you know i mean it was uh it was just it was a workhorse you know it's it does what it's known for you know it'll take what you give it and it'll handle it all right simon so i'm gonna be messaging you about that and see what we can do erico has joined us Let's see. All right, so STEM mastering. Um, we had a conversation at one of the events and you were excited about STEM mastering. Mm -hmm. what, are, what are some reasons that people seem to be against STEM mastering? Oh, the number one instant response to STEMs is that's mixing. You know, 
that's that's the knee jerk response. That's mixing. That's not mastering. You know, that's remixing. That's not mastering. And and I agree with those concerns. I think that that is a valid concern. I don't feel that it has to be mixing. I don't feel that it has to be remixing. And furthermore, you can remix a stereo file. You don't need stems to do it. So uh, you know the that message I think has its validity, but I think you can apply that same message to stereo mastering. Anyone can mutilate a track, whether it's through stems or through stereo. Uh, so I do feel that over the last you know 15 years or so, the concern around that particular subject, hey, that's mixing, hey, you're going to screw up my mix, has created um, a lot of tension and hesitation around the subject. And just I, as I've been sticking my feet more into it over the last few years, I'm finding ways where it can really benefit a project. It's not, as we discussed when we were hanging out, talking about this, um, it's not a go-to process. So I'm not saying, you know, I'm not promoting it from the standpoint of every project should use it. But as I had mentioned to you when we were talking about it, the way I look at it is in a situation, in a certain situation with a record, when the producer and the mixer and the artist comes in and we're all talking about it, if I feel like stems can really benefit the project, we'll talk about it as an option. If everyone wants to pursue it to check it out, we'll check it out. You know, and then if we're getting results above and beyond what we would get with stereo, we'll go down that route. But this is a very, um, there's a lot of buy-in from everybody involved in the record, including the mixing engineer, including the producer. So I'm not off on some tangent saying, you know, I know what's best, let's do it. It's, it's all in the interest of the music, it's in interest of the project. Um, but what you can do in this process does open up some interesting possibilities that you don't get in the stereo mastering world. Why does it require um, such a big buy-in from everybody? My, my take on that is, it, well, A, it's just based on my experience of doing this process because, again, there's, there's a lot of um, concern around the tracks going in an odd direction after the mixes have been created, and I think that's a very valid concern. So having everyone involved in the process of reviewing those things really keeps everything, you know, the eyes on the prize, shall we say. And I'll jump ahead real quick and just kind of give you a quick overview of my process, and I think that'll help explain, you know, or answer your question here. So for instance, um, let's say you're mastering a stereo track, right? Well, you're going to take the stereo track, you're going to apply EQ and compression to it, you're going to give it back to the team, they're going to check it out, maybe you want a revision, you know, there you go, you're done. That's the stereo mastering process. Um, the way I approach stem mastering is we master the stereo file first. What does that give us? That gives us the target. And what that also allows us to hear is what ranges of frequency buildup are we having? You know, what trade-offs are we making dynamically to reach a loudness goal, for instance? You know, in essence, it, it uncovers what we're doing for compromises. There's a phrase you hear very much in mastering today. It's very well promoted. I, it's kind of caught on in the industry, and it's called you got to give something to get something. And typically what they mean is you got to give up dynamics to get loudness. You got to give up something else to get loudness. You got to give up something else to get loudness. Usually it's you're giving up a number of things to get loudness. So, um, but stepping back for a second, like I said, by doing the mastering of the stereo track, we can now uncover what those compromises are. Then we can take a look at doing stem work and making changes at the stem level so that when we sum it all, we're not having those compromises. So when you consider that process of mastering stereo first and then going into stems, that's a situation where having everybody involved really makes a huge difference. And what 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 are the benefits like what do you notice that you can bring extra when you do stem mastering when you listen to a project what what you know what do you what are you sitting there thinking um i can do such and such or i i can bring out this emotion like what are the actual benefits that you notice it's well it's really when it's gonna happen because again not every project is like oh let's do this you know but when the project comes in and it's like you know what this could really, this project could really benefit from this process. Uh, what we're usually encountering as an above and beyond result is, you know, 
a maintained sense of dynamics. You know, the punch is there, the power is there, the definition has maintained because we're not dealing with stereo cuts across parametric EQ to make room for something, you know, so that compression can do its job. We're not doing a ton of dynamic EQ or multiband compression to compensate for something. So again, that loudness can reach its goal. We're able to make these modifications at the stem level. Once we get it there, we have a maintained, you know, sense of punch and power. You know, you still feel the kicks and the snares coming at you. It's not the, you know, sort of 2D effect that we get from heavy levels of limiting today. And stereo image is usually wider. So in essence, you know, a short answer to your question would be maintaining the integrity of the mix. You know, typically when we're looking at this process for a project, they're projects that have very large amounts of dynamic range within the mix. So, you know, if I'm getting mixes that are already near, you know, that sort of QA, QC process of mastering, where it's like, okay, my function as the mastering engineer is really, you know, a half a dB QA, QC, which is, you know, a very common function of the mastering engineer, then guess what? That's what we're doing. But if I have an artist coming in with a record and the mixes have anywhere from like 15 to 20 dB of throw, you know, from peak to RMS, and it's like, okay, we want to get this loud, we want to get it punchy, we're looking at some pretty serious trade-offs to get there. You know, we're looking at like 15 dB, 16 dB of compression, you know, to get that baby up. That's a lot of work across the stereo track. We're going to be making a lot of trade-offs. So in that situation, that presents it as a candidate for doing this. And then, you know, the process of discovery will show us whether or not we're going to do it. Okay, what did it, since, since I hear so many people being against STEM mastering, what what is it going to take? What do they need to do? Like, say there's a, a, someone who actually does mastering. They're, they're a mastering engineer. Mm -hmm. and let, me, let me rephrase that. What did it take for you to get good at STEM mastering to where you actually saw the benefits? Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. <laughs> the, what it took for me was understanding how to run my rig in a way that, you know, um, how can we achieve the same result, but, you know, better and better meaning how can I maintain the integrity of the mix? How can I maintain a really good sense of punch and power and not have to make these compromises? So I needed to get a multi-channel DA converter set up so that I could do, you know, multi, you know, multi pairs of stereo pairs to get out. And then I needed a summing mixer to bring it all into two track. And then from there it goes to my stereo analog rig. So I'm coming out. Typically, I do four stereo stems, maybe five if we have to, but I like to keep it to four. And then we'll sum those through. I'm using the, the Dangerous Convert 8s for my multi-channel DA. I'm using a Dangerous 2-Bus Plus. I had a 2-Bus before, sold it, got the new 2-Bus Plus, because uh, I like a couple of the features that it has. That sums it to two-track, and then it's going through my analog two-track rig from there. But, I mean, shit, I've been in mastering almost 17 years now, so I've got a good collection of toys. You know, uh, it's a it's a hefty analog rig, and so as I've been developing the service, one of the things that came to mind was, you know, hey, we're applying color in the analog domain. That's one of the things that people love about color. You know, about analog is getting that color, that sense of width and presence and air. You know, you only get that you know from the analog domain. But having all these tools, you know, I'm usually using maybe one compressor, one EQ on a stereo path. It's not a heavy path. But having all these tools, tools at my disposal, if I can create that multi-channel environment with stems, I can leverage more of these tools there, again, to sum up to a greater result. And so uh, I kind of veering off the path, coming back to answer your question, multi-channel DA converters, a summing mixer, and I had to make some changes to my patch bay to support all this. And that way I can patch in what I need at the stem level and then sum it to two track and then I've got my stereo rig from there. So beyond that, it really came down to finding a process. And because, I mean, I come from mixing too, and I agree with the argument, it's easy to get into remixing territory with stems. It's easy and it's dangerous. Therefore, through that discovery process is how I came to the conclusion of, let's master the stereo track first, because that gives us a definitive target of what we're trying to reach without the compromises that we encounter by doing the stereo master. Understanding that process gave me the direction to really make this a successful service because everybody knows what the goal is. 
everyone knows what we're reaching. And that, just trying to you know, understand a better way to create this so that we're alleviating the risk of remix and we're also gaining the confidence of everyone involved that you know, we have a known direction where everyone's gonna be happy with the result. So creating that process has been just as important as creating the actual rig to support the process. I was glad when you came and you, you started talking about um, STEM mastering because what, what I've noticed is people will say something is not good or doesn't work um, before they've actually spent the time that it takes to really understand it. Mm -hmm. And it happens all the time. Oh, yeah. And then somebody will come along and they're like the Gracie brothers, uh, you know, in, in martial arts. So they come through and they're, they're masters at it. Um, mm -hmm. And and even sitting down having a conversation with somebody about it, then it becomes an argument, and you just have to show people. Yeah. Um, so what what the four you said four to five stems, preferably four. What are they that you prefer? Oh well, I mean, if you take a rock record, which is the easy easiest example, right? Uh, drums, bass, guitar, vocals, four stems. You know, um, and it's I've been doing some hip hop with this, and we'll have like you know the kick and all of the low end information, drums, the bass on its own, and then other percussion and vocals. And you know maybe we'll try and sum the synth somewhere. But uh, hip hop and urban music is a great example of making this work as well because I'm getting, you know, everyone gives you references as far as like loudness targets. And by the way, I I'm gonna say this before this question even comes up, there is no loudness war. There is loudness. It's a reality. We all deal with it. But to say that there's a war is I personally think is just we're, we're past that. There's loudness. So people bring in references and they're like, you know, here's my gain target, you know, and it's we're at a point where you can't beat anything because we're at the we're at the, you know, we're at the maximum that physics can support. So we know what the gain target is. It's as loud as possible. So when you get into that kind of territory, especially with material that has very heavy bass, like hip hop and urban, there's a lot of competition down at the bottom with you know those kicks, with those uh, those bass lines. That is a genre that can really benefit from this. Uh, but again, how the project is created by the producer and the mixer will even dictate if it's even possible. But if it is possible, it can be a really great way to make this happen. I know I'm again I'm veering off from your question, so coming back to your question, I like to go with four, and we'll see based on the mix how we can chop it up. Because I'm looking at it from a dynamic standpoint and from a frequency standpoint. How can we group these things to where, you know, again, I'm not veering off in remixing territory, but I'm addressing issues that I would want to address at the stem level. So I'm not having to do tons of automation or very, you know, lots of overlapping processes in stereo, you know, to compensate for things that I could easily compensate for with, like, let's say one, one point of dynamic EQ on one stem that's handling a note that blooms, you know, or... I'm cutting out one area of EQ across three stems so that the primary instrument can exist that dominates that frequency so that when we bring the gain up, I don't have a lot of frequency buildup happening and then I'm having to do big cuts across stereo. You know, those are two examples of like how I would be using the stem process to leverage minor change at a granular level so that I have less big change at the stereo level. Okay. Um. You, you keep saying, uh, uh, basically apologizing for veering off like that's bad, bro. I'm okay, it. I'll stop that. <laughs> well, you're yeah, asking I'm me a question, it. and then I take off on some tangent, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> Stream of consciousness. Um, you're sitting there rattling off good stuff, right? Um, and like with with the loudness. So I just got this phone has 128 gigs on it, right? Yeah. And I've been I have all this music on there and the sound, it, there's such a drastic change in volume, um, how much something is forward yeah. and back. Like there's, there's all this, these differences between songs that are on different albums over the years. Mm -hmm. And all I'm doing is sitting there while I'm driving, because it's Bluetooth to my car, I'm turning the volume up. And the one thing that I notice is I end up not caring about turning the volume up and down and end up not caring about the difference of loudness between those songs 
because once that volume gets right, it's emotionally affecting me. I get right into the zone and the emotion is there. My mm-hmm. problem has been mm-hmm. getting loudness, but not having that emotional roller coaster and um, having the thing draw me in and just take over me. But each song that I have on my phone takes over me. Um, yeah. Well, even, even at a low volume, it affects me, but I turn that volume up and it takes over me. And that that's the thing that to me, like, whether we're loud or not loud, eh. I mean, I like loud and I, I'm, I, I'm able to get loud, as loud as I want, no problem. But it really became a, a thing of, um, once I got the loud, is what I'm presenting effective, emotionally, really right. moving the audience. The so loudest we, thing, yeah. hmm? the loudest thing I, I think is interesting at this point because, um, I mean, if we look at the LUFS concept, and what people are doing in streaming with gain normalization. You know, this is all great stuff. And I think we're headed in the right direction. So, you know, change like this happens slowly over time. We're, we're talking about unwinding, you know, something that has been wound up over a 30 year period. So it's going to take a little while to move, you know, in a different direction from that. But we have the steps pointed in that direction. Um, but the just from my own experience of working with artists and you know making records, uh, whether it's record labels, a and people, producers, the artists themselves, the mixers, uh, you know, you run into a situation. Uh, you know, it's 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 comparative analysis. Meaning, I hear a lot of people talking about L- LUFS and you know broadcast streaming normalization, and that's great. But the first thing, uh, you know, someone who receives the master does is compares it to something else. So that process you know will continue to maintain you know the level of gain that we have in the market today so yes streaming will solve this in a way where things are normalized and we have the possibility for transients to come back dynamics to come back however until we have a unilateral way for people to experience a file where gain normalization is part of the listening process regardless of the way they're playing it there will always be you know, a comparative situation of, well, I noticed mine's, you know, not as punchy as this other thing. And and all of that is based off of short duration listening tests. That's what all of this loudness stuff is based around is, you know, impulsive responses and how the brain perceives it in a short duration of time. Um, So it's, I will say one of the things I do like about how I'm running the STEM process is the way I run the rig, I'm actually able to generate a number of files all from one pass. Let's, for instance, because I am doing stems, I can mute the vocal, we can do an instrumental version at the same time. You know what? Sometimes the vocal shifts around a little bit in the master, so I can do a vocal up, vocal down, and a main all at the same time. I just do another print. You know, because I've got everything queued up. All right, let's move the vocal up a dB. Let's pull it down a dB. You now have three versions. Oh, you've got the instrumental. You've got four. You know what? I'll do one without the final stage of limiting because everything's queued up. Now you have an LUFS broadcast streaming version. So you're coming away with five or six versions from one configuration. So you're not having to master a bunch of files. You just have, you have the rig set up. You've done the work. Now you just print the versions and you're off and running. So... In a way, you know, that again, it can generate uh, more value, you know, to the project because you're able to deliver more at the time of doing it. Um, and that's, I'm really a big fan of the LUFS stuff. I'm a big fan of what we're doing in streaming. I think the big question is how we're going to get there, you know, because if you look at the world of digital distribution, you know, if you're an artist, you submit your tracks up to TuneCore or CD Baby or DistroKid and they put it in the channel. You know, there's no, well, hey man, is this your broadcast streaming master or is this your master going to iTunes, you know, download music store? You know, because potentially they could be two different assets. You know, one that people buy, which has the loudness quotient, and one that people listen to over streaming, which doesn't. You know, that would be fantastic. But we don't have that that process in the market yet. So again, it's we're at, you know, the entry point of this kind of stuff, and we'll get there. But in the meantime, where we're at, like I said. I don't believe we have a loudness war. You know, there are so many plugins that can nuke things and destroy things, and they've done them better than they ever have in the past. That we even have what two competing computer algorithm companies out there now that you know do mastering. So, <laughs> you know, 
if a computer algorithm can crush it for you, then you know, so can Audacity. You know, so can you know, T Rex. You know, I mean, it's the the whole concept of limiting is has become simplified to the point where, you know, loudness is loudness, man. We can crush it. Anyone can crush it. The question is, and I agree with what you said. The question is, can you maintain the emotional impact of the music? You know, as the result of the master, can you maintain the feeling that people experience? You know, in the master, and how are you going to do that? That is the skill of the mastering engineer. That is where you know uh, the finesse of what mastering was known for came into play. I think over the last 15 years, it has turned into you know mastering is a function of loudness, and and I think that's kind of diluted the actual value of the mastering industry. You know, at its core, we're talking about you know sonic pureness. We're talking about emotional impact. We're talking about finesse of you know critical listening and the decisions that come from critical listening. So, you know, we can all make it loud. It's how are you going to really bring it out and make it sound amazing? Maybe loudness is part of that, but it doesn't need to be all of that conversation. You know, mastering is these other things. And so, I personally see when it can happen. You know, when the project can make it happen, stems is a great way. To apply that finesse and to apply that beauty across a project and really give people a competitively loud master, but it doesn't have the compromises that we encounter when we go through stereo. Um, I made. Oh, go ahead. You have a question. Oh no 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 no! It's something else. Go ahead. You made what? I made a I made a uh, a page for today's um, chat. So and you know people can check this out you know while we're talking, but at my website at michaelsmastering.com. If you go backslash your name, Hotep, so michaelsmastering.com slash Hotep, there's a page. And uh, I'll just type it in here real quick into this, into this field. Um, so if you go there, I made a page with some, with some files. And they're all labeled. This is a project that's currently being worked on, and the artist was kind enough to let me use their music as uh, as an example here. So I've made a number of files that kind of show this process. And let me open it up real quick just so I can take a look at it myself. Okay, I'm seeing a bunch of stuff here. Yeah. Wow. Oops, that's not the right page. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh. I'm seeing, let's see, four times. Yeah. It's like one. You got my two, blog page, which is under construction. That's my bad. Yeah, I got a blog page with a whole bunch of stuff. Awesome. Colossal failure. Epic fail. All right. And welcome everybody that just joined. Gavin just came in. We have Irko. We have Hakeem. We have Ben. We have Brad. And let's see. So his website is Mike is MikeWellsMastering.com. So MikeWellsMastering.com. You can get him um, on Facebook also. Let's see. So I just Mike sent him the right link. Yeah. So MikeWellsMastering.com forward slash STEM, STEM examples. STEM examples. There you go. It was your name yesterday, and then I thought I should make it more STEM related. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Let's see. I'm going to it now. Let me know if you see it. Yeah. STEM examples. These are all 320 CBR, stereo encoded, MP3. Um, so you know they're they're as high res as you're going to get in the MP3 world. And you know there's a number of files there. So at the very bottom is the mix, which is very quiet. So you know I put it at the bottom so it won't poke at you immediately. But at the very top, you have the mix just coming up to the level of gain we're doing with the other masters, which is a 12 dB peak limit, which is pretty heavy. And then underneath that, you can hear, you know, 
the analog stem master. Uh, underneath that, the analog stereo master. And then underneath that, the, uh, the same master done with just plugins in the box. So, you know, you can kind of cycle through those, but what you are going to hear is a definitive change in transient punch and power as you go between um, all of them. And the stems you're going to notice really pops out. You've got a pretty big sense of dynamics coming out of that guy. They're all at the same level. They're all hitting around, you know, minus five as far as their RMS level goes to, to zero dBFS. So it's loud, you know, it's loud. But you've also really got a maintained, you know, punch and integrity here. Big clarity, a lot of, you know, width in the image. And so, you know, we're talking a lot about how to do it and, you know, the ideas around it. But this is a way for you to hear it right here, right now, you know. Okay, this is this is perfect. All right, everybody, it's it's MikeWellsMastering.com forward slash capital S in stems and a capital E in the examples. If they're lowercase, it didn't come up for me. I put them capitals, uh, the S and the E, uh, because that's what I see on this link, and it worked. Yeah, so yeah. MikeWellsMastering.com forward slash capital S for stem and examples capital E and it should come up and I'm gonna I'm gonna end up putting that on the uh, YouTube yeah uh, so that people could just click on it okay and and you guys can hear examples there so Mike um, the yeah, color. oh go ahead yeah let's talk about these real quick so like I said earlier how did how did we start doing this well you know I got the mixes from these guys and the mix is at the very bottom of that page right just the mix you're gonna notice from listening to that, it's a great mix. These guys, it's a phenomenal record. These guys were very nice to let me, you know, use this thing because we're currently working on the record, but I wanted something where I could show, you know, before and after and a few other things. And these guys were kind of, they're called Hard Youth, great band. Um, and so they're here in LA and it was recorded at cello. And so it's, you know, it's really nice stuff. Um, but anyway, you'll notice with the mix, you know, really, really big transient you know pop you know they've got really you know the snares and the kicks there's a lot of movement in this mix you know it's great it's dynamic it's wide it's open but it's also it has a huge you know dynamic range so if we want to get this to today's level we're doing a pretty significant amount of compression and limiting across the stereo track so when they came in and we talked about it and listened to it i said you know what guys would you be willing to give me four stems you know bass guitar drums vocals just so i can check this out and they're like, why? And I said, well, just how about, you know, just give it to me and we'll check it out. And they said, okay. I said, why don't we just try this out? And so, and this is how I usually do it. You know, I hear a project and I'm like, okay, you know, this would be worth trying. Let's just see how it goes. So we get the stems. First thing I do is I master the stereo track and I'm like, okay, guys, you know, let's go through it. What do you think? And they're like, we love it. This is what we want to do. Yeah, let's do it. I'm like, okay, you know what? Now let me do that same thing and let me do it with stems. And if you guys like it, let's go down this road. And if you don't, let's go down the stereo road, you know, because it's a preference thing, right? But we went ahead and did the stems thing, and they were like, holy shit, this is amazing. And that, you know, moved us into that category. But it is this process of let's use the stereo mix. You know, let's get the master you're looking for. Let's discover, you know, what are we, what are we giving up to get? And can we avoid giving up those things? via another path and the path we're discussing today is stems obviously you could go back to the mix and change things sure but in this case you know that's not what we wanted to do we wanted to go down this route and through this route we were able to generate these results and the results speak for themselves man you know um, the analog master is the approved stereo master and then you know the stem master is what we did to make that goal a reality but without those compromises the digital master is something I did in the box with plugins just to meet you know what the analog stereo master was doing so you could hear the difference between plugins and and analog tools because again there's a big difference and then the file at the very top uh, which is just you know the mix going through it's the UA precision limiter which I think is a very transparent plug-in limiter so I just push that up you know as far as gain reduction wise to meet the level we were doing with the other masters so and that's a 12 dB you know reduction which you're gonna hear again all the artifacts that come from what I would consider a lander job, you know, just five bucks of 
crush. So, you know, anyone can do it. You know, my little sister can do it. So, you know, you can save money from going to Lander because my sister will master your track for five bucks, right? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I mean, the, this is a great way to hear what we're talking about because it's, it's easy to say stems are going to give you more punch. They're going to give you more, you know, sense of dynamics. But you know what? When you hear it, hearing is believing. And so I wanted to make this page because you can hear the difference right there. Um, but yeah, has anyone had a chance to check this out yet? The, yeah, the, you guys are muted. Have you guys had a chance to, while you've been muted? No, I was going to um, wait until we got off of this to listen to it. Because while, yeah. while I tried, you can still hear them talking too. So. Ah, okay. <laughs> you want to take five and I'll let everyone play it for a minute and then we'll talk about it? I mean, I'll, yeah, I'm cool with that if everybody else is. Oh, someone just said they, they checked it out and, yeah, they liked it. Well, I'm going to check it out right now, so. Yeah, I'll, let's just, let's take two minutes. Go ahead and check them out. Just got a message from Johnny V on my phone. Let's see, is that a... So looks like a text message. This is straight to my phone. Oh, that's right. I got my number on my page. I'm sitting there like, hi. He says, uh, Johnny V says, great hangout with Mike. I got to watch about half an hour of it. Wish I could stick around. Um, so while everybody's checking that out, Mike, um, what's up with that O-scope back there, bro? With th this? You got an old scope over to your oh, left and a cell scope. Oh. <laughs> Are you that oh. much of a nerd? That that I was in the Navy and we used those. Oh uh, well, you know I I'm rolling tape this weekend and so I had to check azimuth. You know uh, it's just part ah. of the stuff. So you okay. know, you know, just part of calibrating the machine. You got the MRL out. You got an azimuth check. All that stuff. So yeah, I was setting it up this morning. Yeah, that brings back memories. Um, mm -hmm. one of, one of the questions that I'm going to have is uh your tools the actual gear over to your your left um mm -hmm. it's what colors each tool bring to the table what fields or colors um they bring to the table um sure. after everybody's had a chance to check this out and and the other is um somehow sooner or later there, there's got to be something where you mastering guys um People are coming in and learning in person because there, there's nothing like in person. Um, so somehow, some way, getting it to where there's a seminar where the mastering is actually done, we're hearing it, um, and we get this experience, and it's part of our education where we're getting the experience of it. Because, because like, if I were to go and sit down with you and you were to go through one of my mixes, um, I would come out changed because of that process and i'm wanting some way for there to be a way for you guys to get paid and we get this experience like there's a group of people who can come in pay get an experience with you and actually learn to where we would start as we do projects we already ahead of time know we might want to do this or it have it affect how we do things like um i'll give you an example I did not believe this analog gear stuff until Greg from Kush Audio uh, actually showed me Clarifonic and demonstrated for me. I, I just didn't know. And I was doing fine. I was happy with what I was doing. But then I heard that Clarifonic and said, oh, wow. And it added something else. I actually, I'm going, I want to buy one now. But it added, it, it made me realize that analog gear there really is something to the stuff people were saying. And I wasn't missing it. I couldn't care less because I was getting the results I wanted. But now mm -hmm. I have a, it's like a whole nother dimension. Oh yeah. A whole set of tools that I have to help do the job. Um, oh, real quick. Brad had a question about um, compression and vocals or something like that. Brad, um, before you head out, would you hit him with your question while everybody's listening to that stuff? Yeah. Thanks. Um, nice job, Mike. Um, yeah, I like the equipment behind you too. I used to work with it, <laughs> like uh, like Matt was saying. Anyway, um, my specialty is vocals. I I don't really do much with other instruments. I have had a recording course in my background, so I 
we can kind of follow along with you guys. But, but when I'm listening to a uh, master product and I'm evaluating the vocals, the feel, uh, sometimes the technique, uh, just, you know, to know what's going on out there so I can help my people better. And one of the things that I am able to hear now is when a vocal is compressed in the mix because the singer has yelled and gone over the the line and so the you know it's pushed into the compression area so it gets like you say crushed now when you get that and it's already been compressed do you find that you still compress it further uh well i mean the the short answer is it depends um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I understand. I just yeah. trying to get some basic principles here. Sure. Well, let me give you let me give you some examples. You know, um, and maybe that'll help. The it's there are plenty of times where you'll get a mix and you're going to need to do you know a good amount of compression and limiting to get it to uh, a commercial gain target, right? Mm -hmm. And so. If there are compression artifacts present in the mix, those compression artifacts will become more noticeable in the master. So, because yes, you will be applying compression on top of compression. So there are, then you enter the world of, you know, skill, you know, that again, we, we don't talk about in mastering. What we talk about is loudness. So if we put this loudness, you know, uh, topic to the side and talk about the skill that is involved in mastering, you can now look at, well, what are the ways that I can address not having further artifacts of compression, you know, applied to compression that I'm already hearing present in the mix. And that can be something like um, multiband compression. But I would say in today's world, I'm having a lot more luck with dynamic EQ. So, and so specifically to your point, here's how I approach those situations. You know, we're, I use like everyone in analog today, we've got a hybrid of tools, right? We've got digital tools and analog tools. And so before I go to analog, I'll have some automation in the box using like a dynamic EQ to address those, those notes as the track is playing. So that way I'm not using a blunt force operation of a compressor. I'm just using, you know, one point of dynamic EQ as the song plays to basically get it in line before we go to analog so that I'm in a good place when we go to stereo. Um, 